Reading 98 from the Psychological Commentaries on the Teachings of Gurdjieff and Ouspensky by Dr. Maurice Nicole, Volume 1. Birdlip, December 14, 1943. Commentary on the Relationship of a Man to Himself. Each of us is related to three things. First, we are related to our bodies, about which we know practically nothing. The body is sometimes ill, sometimes well, and so on. We may get certain knowledge of our bodies, but we never really know about them, as their complicated organization is far beyond our comprehension. There is, however, a quite definite side in our lives that concerns our relationship to our physical bodies. In general, the instinctive center looks after us in this respect, provided we do not abuse our bodies too much. This is our first definite relationship. If a person has had no trouble with his body, he is quite surprised when trouble of this kind begins. Our next relationship is to the external world, to things, to people, to affairs that take place around us, and such things as friendships, business, politics, war, and all our relationships with matter in general, with dealing with things, with cooking, with carpentry, with building, and also with managing people, finding jobs, making both ends meet, and not only with making both ends meet, but with tying a bow. Generally speaking, most people lives are concerned with these two relationships and failure and success are possible in both cases. I mean that a person in the first relationship may have great trouble with the body, may be often ill and so on, or he may find out how to keep in better health. And as regards the second relationship, the relationship to external life, he may fail to adjust himself to anything or anyone, or he may be more successful. He may find, for example, something in external life that he is good at. Now, we must speak about the third relationship, which is really the subject of this teaching, namely the relationship of a man to himself. For most people, this relationship is unnecessary. A man is concerned usually with the first two relationships only, and to a certain extent these two are connected. If a man is starving, for instance, he has a bad relationship to his body and therefore must find a better relationship to external life in order to nourish the body. But this third relationship is different. For the purposes of mechanical life, it is unnecessary. In a young country, you will generally find that it is only the first two relationships that count. <clears throat> Food, health, business are the main preoccupations. Now, both the body and the affairs of the world are external to us. In what sense are they external? They are external in regard to the third possible relationship. In thinking of myself from the angle of this work, I have sometimes found it useful to think of these relationships and keeping them clearly in mind to try to observe in which relationship I am, especially at fault. I may be in a wrong relationship to my body, or again, I may be in a wrong relationship to external life, or I may be in a wrong relationship to myself. That is, as regards the third relationship, I may be thinking where I should feel or feeling where I should think, and so on. Or again, I may be asleep to myself. This applies to everyone. If we feel something is wrong, we tend to look outwards. We may decide we are ill. We look outwardly at our bodies. Or we may decide that other people are wrong, in which case we look outwardly once more. However, one may decide that one is wrong in oneself that one is not in right eyes, that one has not sufficiently nourished this third relationship to oneself. 
Perhaps one has not really worked on oneself for some time. Perhaps one has not connected one's thoughts that have come in from higher parts of centers. That is to say, one has not been listening to oneself and has missed what is being said to one. There are many sayings in ancient esoteric literature bearing on man's relationship to himself and to all the different parts in him, both higher and lower, that refer to the necessity of keeping a certain heat within him. You know that an egg that is being hatched must not be allowed to get cold too long. You have heard also in this teaching that a fire must be lit to heat the alchemical retort in which the metallic powders are contained, which must eventually be fused together. As long as this is not so, every tap on the walls of the retort shifts the powders. This means that every change incidental to life shifts us inside, and we have no power of inner resistance to the external world and its changing events. Or you can compare man as he is to a kaleidoscope of which every tap changes the pattern. The object of the third relationship to oneself is ultimately to form something permanent. First of all, in the hierarchy of development comes the establishing of observing I. Then, above this, comes the formation of deputy steward, which is a collection of eyes that wish to work. Some of these eyes may really wish to work, and some may only pretend that they do. But when deputy steward is strong enough, then there is a possibility that steward himself may come, and above him lies the possibility of the coming of real I, something permanent and unshakable. When this happens, there is a real man, a man such as we do not know in ordinary life. Now, in this commentary, I wish to talk to you about this third relationship. We miss many opportunities for work because we forget about this third relationship. We may be depressed by illness or by the external situation in life to which we happen to be related at the time. And finding no particular comfort in either of them, we may feel at a loss. But over and above, both these relationships, lies the possibility of the third relationship. We forget to summon the work just at the very time when we should summon it. Our ordinary thoughts connected with our ordinary daily affairs do not lead into the ideas of the work. We have to jump. We have deliberately to make a connection with the work. And we must all find different ways of doing this. You all realize how life puts us to sleep, how our preoccupation with our life problems cuts us off from the influences of this work. I would define two different conditions in which anyone in this work can find himself. One is simply that a man finds himself in the condition in which he feels immersed in things. He feels rather depressed, worried, anxious, and so on, and being, as it were, unable to lift his head up, he views life along the vistas of his own negative feelings. The second condition occurs when a man knows he is in a bad state from the work point of view and cannot find out how to get rid of it. I think that it is this second state that is most interesting to study in oneself. One knows one is asleep, one recognizes that there is something all wrong, but one does nothing to help oneself. It is just here that some of the worst negative thoughts about the work can arise. One is, so to speak, out of the work in oneself, out of the eyes that can conduct or transmit it, and yet, although one knows this, one does nothing about it. Now, this state can again be divided into two. You may be in some kind of heavy, indifferent state and not wish to do anything at all, although you realize your situation. Or you may be in that interesting condition which is called tempting God. 
you may feel you should be helped, but in both cases you have no technique developed in you that can reestablish some kind of harmony within yourself. Here, one of the many aspects of Sly Man comes in. You may go about in a miserable mood, complaining that you cannot feel the work and expecting to be helped from on high. But if you feel that you have lost contact with yourself, <clears throat> if you feel that this third relationship, which the work is about, has gone wrong and wish to reconnect yourself, you may find some way to do it and deliberately apply it without spending time in being miserable. What is one's task under such circumstances? One's task is to get into different parts of centers and into different eyes that can feel the influences of the work. Recently observing myself under such a condition, I began quite deliberately to think of the Ten Commandments. I tried to repeat the first five commandments from memory and found I did not know them distinctly enough. As you know, the first five commandments are psychological, and although the second five commandments are also psychological in their ultimate meaning, they refer in the first place to our relationship to external life. But the first five commandments refer only to our relationship to ourselves. Take the opening commandment. Thou shalt have none other gods before me. If this teaching, coming from conscious influences, were so powerful that one worships nothing else, namely that everything else was in the second place, one would be in a position to resist all the evils of the body and of life. Perhaps you see what I mean. You would be held up the whole time by a strength that nothing could break. Then I thought of what Christ said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And just by thinking of these references to following the will of higher beings, from which the teaching of this work comes, I felt a complete transformation taking place in me, which was like a shock. And suddenly everything looked different, people looked different, and I felt throughout the whole of my body a certain lightness. You know how the work teaches that if you give yourself the shock of self-remembering, it changes even the whole working of the body so that all the cells in the body receive a different food. I assure you that this can be experienced often by every one of you. Remember that always what you value highest is God for you. What you value most, you worship, and what you worship is God. What you value most controls all your being. In this sense, God is a reflection of you, and God is according to your level of understanding. We worship strange things and have strange gods. But there are many other ways of getting oneself out of a bad inner state. You must understand that no work is possible unless you get into these bad states because they are tests, or if you like, temptations, which are absolutely necessary in order to make us skillful in dealing with them. You will not learn to swim well unless you are often dropped into the water. And it is always surprising that some of you think that if you pass into a bad state, it is because you cannot do the work. It is just in these bad states that one can work and learn what it is about. It is quite an interesting view that was once given a long time ago to regard bad states as something about which you must be clever and use, as it were, every possible intelligence and technique to get out of them. There are many different forms of self-remembering, and Sly Man was once defined as he who knows how to remember himself in different ways, at different moments. Sometimes, when one is in a bad state and attempts to get out of it and fails to do so, one can be consciously passive to it, without being negative and without identifying with it fully, having the inner certainty that it will pass provided one does not let negative imagination work 
and does not consent to its presence. This is a form of self-remembering and is just as if one has to wait and knows that one has to because it is raining too heavily and one cannot go out just at present and yet remains certain it will clear. The work exists for one as an, in, as an additional way of living. It is extra. All right relationship to oneself depends on the feeling of integrity in regard to the work as something extra and valuable. Once this has been established in you, namely that you see clearly in your inner vision that the work is something extra and valuable, the work will begin to touch you and find a way for you. Now, in conclusion, as regards the work finding a way for you when you begin to give it a place in yourself, let me say this. Everyone has problems and troubles. No one is without them. We try to find solutions, final solutions, as if afterwards there would be no further trouble. Remember that there are no final solutions to anything. To try to find final solutions to things is like trying to do away with the waves of the storms of the sea. You have to have a good ship, a good rudder, and a good compass. The solution to things lies in seamanship. Or, to change the metaphor, it is said in this work that it sells leather from which you can make good shoes. You cannot clear away all the mud and stones and pebbles, but you can construct good shoes to walk over them 